Don't make it bad Take a sad song and make it better Judah then matches Enoch's ancient warning with a more recent one from the apostles. Peter, John, Paul, they all predicted that corrupt teachers would arise and distort the good news about Jesus. And they themselves were echoing Jesus' early warning about the same thing. And so this church should need no more convincing. These teachers have to be dealt with. So Judah then moves into his closing charge. He picks up his opening line about contending for the faith, and he unpacks how to do so with a cool set of metaphors. He describes the community of Jesus as God's new temple. And so they are to build their lives on the foundation of the most holy faith, which refers to the core message of good news about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for our sins. On that foundation, the church is to build itself through a dedication to prayer, by devoting itself to the love of God through obedience. And the integrity of this building will be maintained by staying alert for the return of Jesus to bring his justice and his mercy. And in doing this, they will help each other stay faithful to Jesus. Judah then concludes by praising the God who will protect his people and keep them from falling too far from his grace. The short letter of Judah is powerful and puzzling for many modern readers who ask why he quotes from texts that aren't today considered part of the Hebrew Bible, like 1st Enoch or the Testament of Moses. It's important to remember that Jewish culture in this time was immersed in religious texts. Jesus, his family, all the early Jewish Christians grew up reading the Hebrew Bible along with many later books that were based on and inspired by the scriptures. And we know there were ancient debates about whether or not some of these later books should be viewed as scripture, but regardless, they're still important. A book doesn't have to be in the Bible to speak an important message to God's people. And so we have many Jewish texts from this period. They're known today as the collections of the Apocrypha, also called the Deuterocanon, along with the Pseudepigrapha. These were all preserved and read in Jewish and Christian communities. They were treated with great respect. It doesn't mean they were originally designed as part of the Hebrew Bible, but they are part of the biblical tradition. And so Judah, knowing his readers that they would value words from 1st Enoch, he used them to communicate his message, which is this. God's grace through Jesus demands a whole life response, not just intellectual assent. Notice that Judah doesn't criticize or focus on the teacher's theology, but their immoral way of life, which denies Jesus. And so Judah is here applying what Jesus first told his disciples. If you really love me, then you will obey my teachings. For Christians, how you live is the most reliable indicator of what you actually believe. And that's what the letter of Jude is all about. Hey Jude, don't make it bad. Take a sad song and make it bad. Good morning. morning. Got to make sure the mic's muted when that song comes on so you don't hear me sing. <laughs> hey, welcome to our final week of our Hey Jude series. Last week we covered the first 16 verses in Jude. Today we're going to cover Jude 6, or 17 through 25. And last week we saw some pretty eye-opening stuff in Jude that was present in the church that Jude was writing to uh, and is still present in the church today. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to the book of Jude. Jude is a New Testament book. It's after... Uh, Third John and before Revelation, probably one or two pages in your Bible near the back. And while you're turning there, I want to let you know um, about a few introductory or about a few uh, resources we have. Uh, the first one is this introductory study guide. If you didn't pick up one of these last week, we have some available at the resource hub for you about the book of Jude to help you with your study. And we also have Uh, This week's devotional guide, seven days on verses 17 through 25 in the book of Jude. They're available at the front door as well as the resource hub. I've also dropped both of those resources in the Church Center app for your convenience. Now, before we jump into today's sections of Scripture, I want to go back and cover some of last week's text in order to Uh, Use it as an on-ramp as we enter into today's message. We left off last week with Jude warning us that there are people who have entered into the church unnoticed. 
And these people are teaching that because of grace, we can sin without recourse, without any sort of punishment. Yesterday's sin is no longer sin because of grace. And Jude tells us that we must stand up and contend for the faith. Because the world is asking us to accommodate and tolerate sin. And as we jump back into today's text, I want to frame it with a quote from a man named William Booth. Now if you don't know uh, this, William Booth is actually, was actually a Methodist pastor in London who founded the Salvation Army. And in the early 1900s, Booth said this, The chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. Now I want to ask you the same question I asked over and over again last week. Is this happening in the church today? See, in the American church, we've run so far, so fast, away from the Holy Spirit that He's not actually in many of the churches today. We've made church all about rules and rituals, not about a genuine move of the Holy Spirit. And what about Christianity without Christ? Do we see in the American church a softening of the gospel that says, hey, come as you are and stay that way, it's okay rather than a mentality of come as you are and let Christ change you today. The forgiveness without repentance goes back to our confronting conflict series that we've been doing on Wednesday nights in our church. See, we're not actually willing to have hard conversations anymore, and as a result, there is an unwillingness to repent and change from our sinful behavior. The scariest one for me is this salvation without regeneration because it's been happening in the church for decades. We have pushed salvation so strongly that we forgot to tell people, hey, after you get saved, you need to let the Holy Spirit change you. And our culture is so sure that everyone gets to go to heaven that we've completely erased hell and this is exactly what Jude is talking about in his letter. So let's jump in, beginning in verse 8. <clears throat> it says, Yet, in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. As long as we continue to cave to the world and its standard, this is exactly what we are going to get in the church. So many born-again believers view the world through culture rather than Scripture. A biblical worldview says that there is a spiritual world and there is a physical world, and they both have their place. A biblical worldview says that there are rules to living in the physical world, and God is the one who gets to make them because God is the one who created it. And these people that have snuck into our churches, they are violating these rules, and they are deceiving people. They have proclaimed things based on dreams. And God's Word tells us that He's going to pour out His Spirit, that at the end of time there will be people who dream dreams and have visions. So that's a biblical thing. God still speaks through dreams and visions today, but these people are not having dreams and visions by the power of the Holy Spirit. They're having dreams and visions of what they think the church should be which is not biblical. We read this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For there are many false spirits or false prophets who've gone into the world. And by this you will know the Spirit of God. For every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not conf confess that Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming and is now already in the world. Little children, you are from God and ha have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Let them speak from the world, and the world will listen to them. You are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And for this we will know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 
So how do we test the Spirit? This testing is to compare what is being taught to the clear teaching of the Bible. The Bible alone is God's Word. It is inspired and inerrant, and therefore we are to test these spirits to see if what they're teaching lines up with the clear teaching of Scripture. That means what? You've got to read your Bible. You have to read your Bible. How are you going to test if a spirit lines up with Scripture if you don't know what Scripture says? We have to take our faith more seriously. We have to read our Bibles more diligently. Testing the spirits means that we are able to know what truth is by examining the Scriptures. Rather than accepting every teaching, we have to discern as born-again believers diligently studying the Scripture. Is this from God or not? That's why connection groups are so important in our church. In a few weeks, we're going to kick off connection groups. And they are important because we meet every single week to discuss what we're learning on Sundays and how we can apply it to our lives. But these people that have snuck into the church, they're not only teaching false things, they're also defiling the flesh. That means they're just openly sinning and don't care. And what does it matter to them? They have grace after all. Grace covers it, so why not do whatever we want? Even more than that, these people are outright outright rejecting biblical authority. Jude's going to talk about that in a moment. But these people are blaspheming the glorious ones. And who are they? Well, if you read 2 Peter, he talks about the glorious ones. They're demons. That means that these false teachers are just talking to demons. Just casually having conversations with them. And look at what Jude says in verse 9 about the archangel Michael's interaction with the devil. He says, When the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing over the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. See, the angel Michael knew that the Lord was the one who had the power over Satan. So instead of passing judgment, Michael proclaimed the Lord's rebuke. When we stand up and contend for the faith, we have to do so in the power and the authority of the Lord. We have to recognize that God is the one in control. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't rebuke other believers. The point of Rebuking other believers is to bring them back under the authority of Scripture and God. We've got to do more of that in the church today. See, we've stopped calling sin, sin. And because of it, we've compromised in so many areas as a church. The church in America has compromised because we refuse to call sin a sin. Because we want to go along to get along. We've got to hold each other accountable to God's Word. It's not based on our own authority, but based on God's authority. We're not going to change Scripture just to make you feel better. That's what the world is telling us they want. Jude shows us a unique insight into these type of people who are defiling the church. In verse 10, he says, These people blaspheme what they do not understand, and they're destroyed by... All that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. That means these people who snuck in, they don't actually understand what God's Word, or even who God is, probably because they're not reading their Bible. They're making decisions based on their instinct, on their feelings rather than the truth. There are people who sound like they know God's Word. In fact, there are people in pulpits today right now, who have a degree in the Bible. They've been believers for decades. But there's something they don't understand about Scripture. So rather than pressing in and asking the Holy Spirit to explain it to them, rather than going to commentaries and trying to understand what scholars know is true about God's Word, rather than talking to other believers, they decide to teach heresy in the pulpit. They decide, I don't understand it. This makes me uncomfortable. And so I'm just going to teach whatever I want. Or I'm going to not teach this section of the Bible because I don't understand. Or I don't like it. They say things like, hey, the creation story, it doesn't make sense to me. So maybe it's just a myth. 
Or they say things like, a loving God wouldn't send people hell that, to hell. That must be something that they made up in order to scare people into believing the Bible. That is being taught in pulpits today. Because we're unwilling to call sin a sin. We're unwilling to open up God's Word and read it for ourselves. We're unwilling. We're unwilling to actually stand for truth. We'd rather compromise and tolerate. Jude tells us that we have to tolerate these people, right? That's what he says in the next verse. Hey, these people are teaching all kinds of false things. They're teaching lies about what God's Word says, so we just tolerate them, right? Well, that's what, that's what our culture tells us to do. That's not what Jude says, though. He doesn't say, hey, just let them hang out. Let them, let them teach whatever they want. You believe what you believe. I'll believe what I believe. We'll all be fine. No, 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 no. Look at what Jude says in verse 11. He says, woe to them. He pronounces judgment. He sees the path they're on. He sees the false teaching that they have invaded the church with. And he knows that God will not tolerate it for long. He sees the judgment is coming. He says, woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain. They abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. And they perish in Korah's rebellion. Jude says, woe to them. They're walking in the way of Cain. What is that? What is the way of Cain? It's the way the false teachers have been walking. He, they have this rebellious heart clothed by religious rituals. Worship and obedience is based on their own terms. They dislike those who worship God correctly. They want the destruction of other people. They're unrepentant in rebellion when God corrects them. They resent the consequences of sin. They lack an appreciation of God's ongoing mercy. And they have a legacy of corruption in the church. If you read through the book of Jude, he explains this way of Cain over and over again as he describes the false teachers. He says, hey, God wants obedience. They say, nah. Hey, God wants our bodies as a living sacrifice. They say, hey, my body, my choice. God wants our money. How about I take your money instead? God wants the humility. I'm good, too good for that. God wants gratitude. How about some grumbling instead? God wants us to respect authority. Nah, I'm the authority in my life. God expects us to honor other people. How about I slander them instead? God wants the shepherds to feed other people. Nah, I'll just stuff myself. Church is about me anyway. Do you know people who sound like that? I do. I know a lot of people who sound like that. They've made church about them. And they outright disregard what God tells them to do. Jude says that they've abandoned themselves for the sake of Balaam's gain. That means that they are in ministry for the money. And I don't know what ministry they're in for the money. Because there's not much money to have in ministry. But these people are in ministry for the money. They're in it for the glory. Balaam was a false Gentile prophet and these people who have snuck in, they're not motivated by the truth of God's Word. They're motivated by money and glory. And there's a lot of pulpits filled with people like that. And they perish in Korah's rebellion. If you don't know this, Korah rejected the authority of God's Word and he led the Israelites in rebellion against God's ordained leadership. And do you know what happened to him? The earth opened up and swallowed them all whole. Not something I'd want to have happen to me. But these teachers have infiltrated every area of the church. And as a result, people are actually turning away from God and turning to their own ways. But Jude then gives us some hope. He calls us to persevere in the face of these teachers. Look at what Jude says in Jude 17 through 23. <clears throat> he says, But you must remember, beloved... The predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions. Worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, 
praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire, and to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. See, Jude is calling us to remember what we've been taught. Listen, God's Word hasn't changed. Since the moment we had God's Word, it hasn't changed. And we are called by Jude to remember what we have been taught. God's not surprised by what is happening in Jude's church. God is not surprised by what is happening in the church today. We are. We're shocked. How could people act like that? How can you call yourself a pastor and teach heresy? But God's not shocked at all. In fact, the apostle said it was coming. Jude said, the apostle said in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. God knew that there would be people who would mock good things openly. That they would make fun of the truth and they would base what they feel is more important than what is true. And then Jude gives us another billboard phrase. Remember last week I said that you need to underline, circle, highlight, and buy a billboard with the word unnoticed. This week Jude says, it is those who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. I want you to highlight, to underline, to circle that sentence. See, it's not the people who are preaching God's Word that are causing divisions in the church. That's what culture will, let you, will want you to believe. They'll want you to believe, hey, it's these, these bigots in the pulpit who are teaching this. That's what's causing division in our country. It's not the people who are preaching God's words that are causing divisions. It's not those who are standing up to the morals that we are taught as kids. It's not those who are pushing back against this sexual agenda that is being pushed on our children. It's the people who have moved the goalpost. The ones who are blaming us for the division. Those are the ones who are really causing the division. See, truth hasn't changed in the last hundred years. But you know what has? Our feelings. God's Word hasn't changed, but how I feel about it has. Those who are openly mocking God and His Word, they're trying to redefine marriage, redefine gender, redefine morality. They are the ones causing division in the church. And the church in this country is more divided than ever before. But it's not divided based on truth. It's not that we disagree with how we understand God's Word. It's that we disagree on how we feel about God's Word. We're not dividing over truth. We're dividing over feelings. That's exactly what the apostles said was going to happen. God is not surprised by that. Jude goes as far to say, hey, these people, they don't even have the Holy Spirit inside of them. They're not born again. They might be acting as believers, but there's no genuine transformation in their life through the power of the Holy Spirit. That means there are people in our churches today that act like believers. They might know a whole lot about the Bible, but they've never been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not living inside of them. They're just going through the motions. They look great on the outside, but they're dead inside. So Jude gives us some instructions. He says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. There's four things that Jude is encouraging us to do. In the face of these false teachers that have infiltrated the church unnoticed, that we are unaware of, Jude encourages us to do four things. He says, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. How do we build ourselves up in our most holy faith? It's my catchphrase now. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. You want to build yourself up in the most holy faith? Open up your Bible. Study the Scriptures. 
Show up on Sunday morning. Make connection groups a priority in your life so you are discussing with other believers what God's Word is saying. If you're struggling to have faith in your life, it's probably because you've not been working that spiritual muscle. You probably haven't been turning the pages in your Bible every single day. Paul tells us in Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. That means our faith is built up the more we hear, study, and discuss the Word of God. Then he says to pray in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, there are several references in Scripture about praying in connection to the Holy Spirit. One of them is in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. It says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. The, Holy, or the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Some people read this verse and they think that it's referencing a prayer language. That's not what Paul is talking about in Romans 8. He's talking about this beautiful mystery. I, I don't even understand it. It's so hard to comprehend about the move of the Holy Spirit when we don't know what to pray, when we don't have the words, when we are in so much anguish and we don't know what to ask God for. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what we need and He begins praying for us. The God of creation living inside of us, the Holy Spirit, knows what I need more than I do and prays for me. But I don't think that's what Jude is talking about here when he says praying in the Holy Spirit. Paul also references praying in the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 14 and 15 he says, For I, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What do I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, and I will sing praise with my mind also. This passage in 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking about praying with his spirit. He is speaking about praying in tongues. Paul is referencing a prayer language here, which is a beautiful thing that still exists in the church today. Prayer language is a beautiful thing that many people have. But again, I don't think that's what Jude is talking about here when he says pray in the Holy Spirit. When Jude says pray in the Holy Spirit, he is saying pray according to the Holy Spirit. Your prayer should be led by the Holy Spirit. In fact, your entire life should be led by the Holy Spirit. If you're a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit should be leading you in every decision that you make and every prayer that you say should be led by the Holy Spirit. Jude says, keep yourselves in the love of God. This is one of the biggest areas the enemy attacks. Satan wants to get you outside the love of God. He wants you to believe that God doesn't love you. Your sin is too great. Your life is too messed up. You're not worthy of God's love. But I want you to know this. There is nothing you can do God still loves you. God is earnestly chasing after you. Nothing you do, nothing you say, it's not who you are. God loves you because He created you. He loves you enough that He would send His Son to die in your place for your sin so that you wouldn't have to live your life and eternity separated from Him. That's how much God loves you. Satan wants you to not believe that. Satan wants you to think God hates you because of your sin. God wants you to know that He loves you enough to die for your sin. And this is one of the biggest lies that the enemy says to us. You're not good enough for God to love you. Don't believe it. Jude is saying here, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep reminding yourselves, God loves me unconditionally. He loves me enough to die for me. And then Jude says, wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. This is about patiently enduring. The world is a messed up, broken place. And we are called to endure the world for the sake of the gospel. That's part of contending for our faith. Enduring the world. Waiting for God to pour out His mercy. And then Jude gives us three final instructions. He says, have mercy on those who doubt, saving others by snatching them out of the fire, and to others show mercy with fear, 
hating even, even the garment stained by the flesh. Jude is saying, have mercy on those who doubt. There are a lot of believers who struggle with doubt. And Jude is telling us to have mercy on them. Don't beat them down for their doubt. And don't lift yourself up because you don't. Don't think less of them because they doubt. And don't think more of yourself because you don't doubt. Jude says, have mercy on them. They're working out their faith with fear and trembling. Have mercy on them who doubt. Lovingly help them to understand the truth of God's word, but have mercy. It's what we are told to do in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Encourage one another and build each other up. That is what we are called to do as born-again believers. We are not called to tear each other down. We are called to build each other up. When we see someone is struggling in doubt, we are not called to push them further down into their doubt. We are called to lift them up, hold them up in their season of doubt, loving them with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, having mercy on them as they struggle to understand God's word. And then he says to save others by snatching them out of the fire. There are people who are going through life today, who are wandering through life and they're living life on their own. And Jude tells us that we are called to snatch them out of the fire, to save them if at all possible, to go and tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. Matthew 16, 18 says, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That means that we, as born-again believers, should be smoke-stained. See, gates protect, not attack. Hell isn't attacking the church. The church should be attacking hell. And when people get close to us, they should say, What's that smell? It smells like smoke. And you should be able to say, hey, it's me. I've been pulling people out of the fire. We have to go on the offense, church. There are millions of people every single day who are walking through life, living their own way, and they are destined for hell. And when they die, if they don't know Jesus Christ, they will spend eternity there. We are called to go after them. Are you really going to stand before Jesus on the day you die and say, hey, I didn't have time to tell my spouse about you. Hey, I didn't have time. I was too busy to lead my kids to have a relationship with Christ. Hey, I was too uncomfortable. I was afraid to talk to my coworkers about Jesus. No, we are called to snatch people out of the fire. We are called to go from this place to charge hell, and to pull people out. So if you don't smell like smoke, that means you're not snatching people out of the fire. You're not doing what God told you to do. And I understand it's hard. I understand it's uncomfortable. I understand that it's challenging to tell someone that you're close to that if they die today, they will spend eternity in hell. But hell is a very real place. And Jude is telling us it is our responsibility to snatch people out of the fire. To go to the gates of hell, to beat them down, and pull as many people out as possible. That is what we are called to do as the church. And then he says to show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. There's going to be people in our life we encounter who are living in sin, And we are called to show mercy to them. We aren't supposed to beat them down because they're caught up in sin. We're not supposed to treat them differently because they're caught up in sin. We're called to be people of mercy. And this phrase, hating even the garment stained by flesh, means that we are called to hate the sin, but not the person. It's where we get that phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin. It comes from Jude. There are people in our lives that we're going to encounter and they're just wrapped up in sin. We, as God's people, as born-again believers, are called to go to those people to show them the mercy of Christ, to help correct them from their behavior with the truth of God's Word. We're supposed to be loving towards them, hating the sin that they are living in, loving them like Christ loves them. 
Christ hated the sin in our life, but he loved us enough to die for it. That is how we are supposed to be as born-again believers. Listen, the book of Jude is a tough book. It's not a very happy book. There's some people who've snuck into the church. They're teaching false things. We didn't even notice it. It's happening today. The church is continuing to bend, to compromise, to accommodate, to tolerate, and is moving further and further away from the truth of God's Word. We're not going to be that church. We're going to be a church that stands on the truth. But in order to do that, we've got to know the truth. This has got to be a priority in our lives. This can't just be five minutes before you close your eyes at night. You've got to earnestly, diligently study the Word of God. And you've got to start standing up and contending for the faith. We've got to push back this dark agenda that has entered into the church, that has entered in unnoticed. We've got to start calling sin a sin. We've got to stand up for the truth of God's Word. I want to leave you with this <clears throat> as we move into our time of response. I want to lead you with, leave you with Jude's final words. It's called his doxology. And I want to speak them over you today. Because there is hope for the church today. It might not sound like it. Jude paints a very dark picture of the church today. But there is hope. There is hope because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. There is hope because we have God's Word to study and read. There is hope because we know that there are people who need to know the truth of Jesus Christ and we are going to be a church that goes and snatches people out of hell. There is hope for the church today. We've got to stand up. We've got to fight for the truth. Jude says this, Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present yourself blameless before the presence of His His glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen.